Good afternoon. So I hope um, lab test three was okay. So we we start today by announcing uh, that the online course uh, evaluation is uh, open, and uh, you can access the course evaluation by using this URL on this slide. And today we can announce it. Next. Um, lectures which is Thursday I hope that you can bring your laptop but I believe it's also accessible by the smartphone so we will give 15 minutes next lectures so you can have time to fill the course evaluation but you can fill it today or anytime you feel you are comfortable you can fill the course evaluation but we're gonna uh, make 15 minutes from the next lectures at the beginning to fill the evaluation. So if you have a laptop, you bring it with you next time, or if you are um, comfortable to access it with your smartphone, you can, I believe it's accessible by the smartphone. Um, last time we discussed recursions and what happened to the memory during the recursive call. We saw that each recursive call, we store a, a, a frame, stack frame, contains all the necessary information about the recursive methods. And if we do recursive calls very, very frequently, and we have a limited size of the stacks, and if we exceed the limit of the stack size, then we will run out of stack, and we will have an exception stack overflow. And also, we discussed our Hanoi, one of the famous problem in the literatures, and we saw how we solve this problem recursively. We discussed the binary search from recursive point of view, and we saw how we can implement the binary search. Also, uh, we mentioned that to be able to do the binary search and be more efficient uh, to search uh, an array, the array should be sorted on advance. To be able to sort the array, we discussed two uh, famous methods. One of them is merge sort, and we finalize the discussion about the merge sort and how we uh, sort the array using the merge sort. We start discussing the quick sort, but we didn't complete it. Quick sort consider one of the efficient sorting algorithms that are exist, and many of um, programmers uh, rely on the quick sort to uh, sort any array. Today, we will discuss in details how we can implement the quick sort recursively, and also we look on the time complexity of the quick sort for the normal case and for the worst case. As I mentioned, we will uh, continue discussing the quick sort. Also today, we will look at the uh, decisions because many of the method that we implement recursively, we can implement it iteratively. And we will see uh, why we implement recursively, why we implement iteratively, and what is the benefit and disadvantage of using uh, recursive. Also, we will look at uh, deep block at the recursions for some algorithms that we did implemented last time. Okay, and we how we can improve the time complexity of the sum of these algorithms. And finally, I hope we can uh, today. Uh, analyze the recursive methods by uh, extracting the recursion relations, which is the time complexity as a recursive relations, and try to solve it to extract the time complexity for any recursive algorithms. We'll start from the quick sort. Last time we discussed the quick sort, that quick sort is rely on the concept of divide and conquer. So we divide the big problem on small problems that are manageable and solvable. So let us assume that we have an array start from index P up to index R. Now index P can be zero, index R can be array length minus one. So let's say you have an array of 10 elements, P can be zero, R can be nine. Or you can take any partition from the array. That's why we make the discussion here on this slide more general. That's P and R, any index, and you need to sort that part of the array. The first thing is to, to extract and divide this array in two sub-arrays that can be 
may, might be you end up with an empty airway. But the key factor here is, is to divide this part of the array to two sets where you have from P to Q minus R, that's all element inside this partition is less than the value, less than the value of A at Q. And also, the second partition is AQ less than all the element on the second partitions. That's a partition that starts from Q plus one up to R. Now, the question here, what is the index Q? What should I pick index Q? Should I pick index Q to be the first index, P equal to P? Or should I pick Q to be equal to R? In the literature, there's a lot of discussions, a lot of research. What is the best Q that you can pick? Some of people, they have uh, uh, discussions about picking Q as a middle point. Okay? Some of them, no. They just take the first element as a Q element, and they start dividing that array in two partitions. One, all the element less than A Q, and the other element are A greater than Q. Now, divide and concur, so we divide it. Now, we need to sort them. After we sort them, we combine. Now, the arrays are sorted, so just combine them. You, you don't need any comparison. So, you already divide them, okay? And you just merge them together without any comparison. If you remember the merge sort, the merge sort you divide, then you sort, then you combine. But here, no, you divide, you sort and then you combine easily, okay? Now, let's say you have S, you need to start with an array to be sorted, and the size of this array is less than or equal to one, nothing need to be done. So if you have an array of one element, it's already sorted. Now, if you have more than one element, so you're gonna pick an element V as a pivot, and you say, I'm gonna create two partitions, S1 and S2. Where S1, all the element is smaller than the value of P, and S2, all the element is greater than value of V. Then you're going to do recursive call for S1 and S2 until you finalize it. This is an example here. We discussed it last time. We have an array, and we would like to run a quick sort for this array. Now, you need to pick the element V or the index Q. Then you start dividing this array in two partitions, all the element less than V and all the element greater than V. In this example, we're gonna pick the first one is 40 as the buffet. So now the next step is try to go over this array to generate two sets. One of them, all the element less than 40 and the other one is greater than 40. To be able to do this, we're gonna need help from two indices. One indices, we're gonna keep tracking two big index and two small index. The two big index will be pointing to the next element or the first element of the array, and two small index will be pointing to the last element of the array. In this scenario, we pick index zero as a bullet. So the two big index will be pointing to one and the two small index will be pointing at eight. We will start doing for loop. As long as the data store at index two big index less than or equal to the bullet, we're gonna keep incrementing it, this index. That's the first loop. So 20 less than 40, we're gonna keep in the increment the two big index. 10 less than 40, we keep incrementing it. Now we have 80 is greater than 40. At this point, we stop incrementing two big index. Now we start the second loop. The second loop is saying that we're gonna keep tracking two small index. As long as the value store at two small index is greater than the data at the above it, in this case 40, we keep decrementing the two small index. So 100 is greater than 40, that's true, so we decrement it. 30 is greater than 40, that's not true, 
in this case we exit this loop to do the swap. In this case we ask if two big index is still less than two small index, that's true, then we do the swap between 30 and 40. Yes, between 30 and 80. After we did the swap, we're going to ask still two small index this greater than the two big index, that's true, then we're going to repeat the procedure. Otherwise, we're going to go to step number five. Step number five is not shown here. So we're going to back to the first loop. 30 less than 40, that's true. 60 less than 40, that's not true. We stop. We go back to the two small index. 80 is greater than 40, that's true. Continue. Now 7 is greater than 40, that's not true. We're going to do the swap between 7 and 60. Now we're going to ask if the two small index is greater than two big index. That's true. We're going to continue doing the loop. Now, 50 is greater than 40, we stop. Now we have 60, which is greater than 40, we're going to decrement two small index. Now two small index, two big index, they are pointing at the same element. So we again ask, is 50 is greater than 40, that's true. We're going to decrement two small index. Now we have 7, 7 is not satisfied, the condition, so we exit the loop. Now we're going to ask, is two big index less than two small index? That's not true. So we, know we don't need to do the swap. Now we go to the while loop. Is the two small index is still big than the two big index? That's not true. We're going to go to step number five. Step number five, we're going to do the swap between two small index and the index where the bucket is stored. In this case, number zero. So we're going to do the swap between 7 and 40. And you can see at the end of this iteration, you have partition that array in two parts. All the elements from 0 to 3 are less than 40. All the elements from 5 to 8 are greater than 40. Yes, these partitions are not sorted yet. But at least you are satisfied the condition of the quick sort. You end up with a, you start with an array. You pick the element, and you end up with two partition. One, all the element less than the V, and all the second bar element on the second part greater than V. Now we, you end up with this situation. Now we're going to do the recursive call. We're going to do the recursive call for a subarray now. We reduce the size of the problem. We start with the size of the problem for nine elements. Okay. Now we reduce the size of the problem to four elements. We do the recursive call. As you can see, each time we do the recursive call, we reduce the size of the problem until we reach the base case. The base case element, one element. This is the partition algorithm that we just uh, saw in the previous slides. We start for loop for all the beginning up to the end. And we ask if the element is less than the bucket, we do increment. Otherwise, we're going to do the swaps. This is the quick sort recursive call. As you can see, we're going to call the previous function to help us to partition the array and retain the index where the partition is done. Then using this partition index to divide the array in two parts, the beginning up to the partition minus 1, and then from partition plus 1 up to the end. Because at the partition index, where is that? 40 is stored. So 40 is in the right place. All the elements less than 40 is in the first half. All the elements is greater than 40 in the upper half. So you take the lower half or the front. You do the quick sort again for it. And you do take the upper part. You do the quick sort for it. And this is the recursive call. As you can see, we start from the beginning to the end. And each time, our recursive call is reduce the size of the problem until we reach the base case. So to do the analyzation for the quick sort, suppose your partition operation is dividing array almost exactly half. So assume that you start with an array of n. And each time you call the partition, you end up with an array at least n 
over 2. So that is make sure the depth, you start from n, and each iteration you divide an array by n over 2. So you need the depth of this partition will be log n. So at e if the depth is log n, now inside each quick sort to do the comparison to divide it into partition, you need n element. So the time complexity will be log n log n. You start with n, you partition each n in half, n over 2, n over 4, n over 8, n over 16, until you reach one element. So the depth of your partition is log n. Now at each partition, at each iteration, to, do, to divide the array in two half, you need n comparisons. As you can see with two small index and two big index, we have to go over all the n elements until we divide them in two partition, which is order of n. So you have log n uh, times n, which is end up with time complexity n log n, which is the best case. So the best case scenario for the quick sort is n log n. What about the worst case? The worst case is actually you start doing the quick sort for an array that is already sorted. Okay? This is the worst case. So each time you end up not dividing n on two half, n over two, n over two. You end up with dividing array over to one, n minus one. 1, n minus 1. So this is the worst case, which is end up with n square. So if you see here, you have an array that is already sorted. If you pick 2 as a it, and you try to divide this array, you will end up with two partitions. One element which is contained above it, and all element less than the above it is 0. So you have partition, empty partitions. And all the element is greater than the above it, it will be n minus 1. So you can see here, all the element is less than 2 is empty. So you have an empty array, and all element is greater than 2 is n minus 1. So this is the worst case. You end up with an array that has an empty partitions, and the remaining elements are on the second partitions. So in this case, you have n times n, n squared. So this is a, a, a figure will highlight the problem that we are talking about. So imagine you have an array, and each this array is sorted. So if you pick the first element, you end up with the above it, which is the first element, and n minus 1. Each iteration, you end up with n minus 1. So if you have n element, then the depth of this tree, until you reach the one element, will be n. n times n, which end up with n squared, which is the worst case for the quick sort. So the quick sort worst scenario is n times n squared. So if you look at the quick sort, the best scenario, if you have really random an array, random array, which is the normal scenario, you will end up with n log n. But if you really have a sorted array, then you will have the worst time complexity for the quick sort, which is n squared. So the worst scenario happen if you start with sorted an array. Just to give you a remark, the worst scenario is n square. The best scenario is n log n. And if you feel that this quick sort is not efficient, actually the quick sort is the fastest known sorting algorithms on the literature. So given a random array, the quick sort is the fastest algorithms to do the sorting. Okay? Any question about the quick sort? Yeah. 
even the time complexity to check the array is sorted or not sorted, how much the time complexity. If you receive an array and someone asks you to sort this array, you want to say, okay, before I call the quick sort, I need to check if this array is sorted or not. So how many comparison you need to check if this array is sorted? You need n square. You need nested two for loops. Okay? So doing the quick sort for the worst scenario will give you n square. Now, for the best scenario or natural scenario, you will have n log n. And as I mentioned, quick sort consider one of the fastest algorithms. Now, there is a lot of studies on the literatures about where and which element to pick. Is the element at index zero? Is the element at the middle of the array? All these studies sometimes end up with less than time complexity in log n. But all these is not a scope of this course. So we discussed the quick sort as an algorithm. If you do the normal case, you will end up with n log n and the worst case is n squared. Now we will start looking at the recursion and iterations. The choice of iterations or the choice of recursions. If you decide to do iterations, then your program code or the body of your method will contain for loop, while loop, do while loops. But if you look at the recursions, the recursion you should not see while loop or for loop or do while loop. Your body will contain actually if statement, if else statement, or sometimes switch statement. In the iteration, you repeat through explicit use of repetition structures. So you know the end point or you know the conditions that you're going to stop before. If you do the while loop, then you know the conditions. Whenever I reach, for example, you do 10 iterations, or until you finish the array. If you have an array of size n, you keep doing the while loop or do while loop until you give the reach the conditions. In the recursions, you do the recursive calls for the method itself. You are calling the method. You're not doing for loops, okay? You call the method itself. So each time you call the method, you need a new set of arguments and the parameters, okay? And at each time you do the recursive call, you define a new local variables. While in the iteration, you don't need to define a new local variable each, each time. So you start for loop integer i, you set i to be equal to zero. You do inside the for loop, i will stay zero. But if you do the recursive call, at each time you do the recursive call, you will have a new set of local variables need to be initialized. When the iteration will be terminate when the condition is fail to satisfy. If i is less than length, or then once i is greater than the length, you're going to terminate the for loop. Okay? Or if you are receiving the input from the user, when the input is minus 1, you're going to terminate the while loop. So you know the condition when it is terminated. While in the termination of the recursive call, you have a control on the base case. You define the base case where the solution is immediately given to you without any further recursive calls needed. So you define that in your code, you set up the base case in the code, and you let the recursive call do each recursive call, one progress or two steps or one step toward the base case. If you reach the base case, you terminate. If you don't have a base case or your code is broken without a base case, you will end, end up with an infinite recursive call. In this case, you are running out of the stacks. Now, the controls of repetitions used normally by the counter if you're doing it iteratively. So normally you track some counters, sometimes you track some particular conditions, okay? And you keep incrementing i, for example, until you reach the length of the array. You keep doing do while loops, for example, until a specific value is show up. Okay, 
then you break out from the loops. So, but in the recursive call, it's the repetition is by dividing the problem into smaller problem. The input argument that you are sending at each time at each recursive call should be reduced. For example, in the quick sort, you start with array of n. At each time you do the recursive call for the quick sort, you reduce the size of the array until you reach the base case where the size of the array is equal to one element. Then you stop. Other issues that are related to the recursive that you need to consider is more overhead than the iterations. Why more overhead? Because at each time you do the recursive call, as we mentioned, we need a new set of local variables, a new set of arguments, and also we need to store a stack frame for this recursive call. And if we need to go to the memory and access, read, and store the this stack frame, if the recursive call is finished, we have to retain the control to the first callers. And also, more memory intensive compared to the iterative. Iterative, you initialize the integers, which is the for, for loops, only once, and you reserve the memory. But if you, each time you call the recursive call, you have to store the stack frames and also define a new local variables. Any recursive method, this is a general statement, can be solved iteratively. If you think about it differently, you will end up with solving it iteratively. But sometimes you end up with very large number of codes to solve the problem iteratively, like Tower of Hanoi. If you would like to look in the literature and find iterative solution, you'll find it very lengthy code, even very difficult to read and track how it solves the problem. Well, if you look at the Tower of Hanoi in terms of the recursive, you will understand quickly that, okay, we start with n rings on the source. We take n minus 1 to the auxiliary, and then we move 1, which is the last one, to the destination. Then we reduce the size of the problem now to n minus 1, and we keep doing the process. It's easy to understand, and normally the recursion method end up with a few codes, line of codes, compared to iterative. Now, other challenges that we face on the recursive call is what we call a stack overflow errors. If you always do the recursive call, so with infinite recursive, you end up with a stack overflow error if you fail to specify the base case. You run out of the memory. So each time you try to do the recursive recursion, you have to divide the problem. So think about the problem of Tower of Hanoi. You start with n. At each recursive call, you have to reduce the size of the problem to n minus 1. If you're not reducing the size of the problem, you are end up with solving the same problem, the same problem. And this will end up with the recursive, infinite recursive call. If you always would like, let's say, you want a quick sort for an array, you didn't reduce the size of array, you didn't partition the array, or somehow in your code, you're supposed to start with n and then end up with two partitions, and you call again the quick sort for that partition. If you call the quick sort for the same size of the input each time, you end up with solving the same problem again and again, which is the actually the infinite recursion and will run out of memory. Now, infinite recursions, how we can prevent infinite recursions? A problem gets smaller at each time. If you not see this in your implementations, then you have a bad decomposition. You're not dividing the problem in small problems. You sometimes you have the base case, but the base case is not reachable because you're not dividing the problem correctly. Or sometimes you, de you design the code, you think this is a base case, but you are actually, there's no base case in your code, and or you cannot reach the base case. Both are exactly the same, okay? The stack is actually keep track of all the recursive calls. Method begin, add data into the stack. Method ends, remove the data from the stack. 
if you run in the infinite recursions, you will end up with a stack overflow. All that information in this slide are repeated to emphasize on the main things or the main two components that the recursive call should have, which is at least one base case, one recursive call, and at each recursive call, you should do the progress toward the base case. Example of infinite recursions or bad design. If you say you think that this is the base case, so this kind of implementation for the power of x, it's broken because the base case is not exist. As you can see here, we do the recursive call x times power of x while y minus 1. At each time, we reduce the exponent by 1, and we do time x. So we forget about the base case. If we keep doing this, we will end up with stack overflow. So you can see here, if we call this with 4 to the power 3, we try to calculate this, we will end up with infinite recursive call. So the base case is missing on this implementation. Okay. Any questions about the relation or comparison between the recursive and iterative approach? Yes. Yes. If you at least in your implementations, any recursive method, at least you should have one base case and at least one recursive call. If you reach the re base case, the solution is immediately found. That is the definition of the base case. For example, if you're doing the factorials, the base case is factorial of 0 is equal to 1. You don't need to do the recursive call for the factorial. So the base case should stop the recursive call. And when you retain from the recursive call, you start removing the data from the stacks. Okay? Yeah. But if you have, if you have a big statement, then you have a, a, a number that is, is increasing, you set it from zero as the base case, and you move to one, and then if you don't stop it, you must keep going. So how do you stop it? But from your argument, you look like you're saying the base must Normally, normally, recursive calls start with a big problem and reduce the size of the problem, not increase the size of the problem. So if, let's say you have an array you need to sort it. You start with n, reduce the size to n over 2. You do not start from an element, one element, and then two elements, three elements, four elements. Okay? Normally, the recursive will start with the n and reduce until you have one element. That is an example. If you do the binary search, you start with the searching inside array of n. At each iteration, you reduce the search space to n over 2. Now, what you are saying that I start with a uh, recursive call with i is equal to 0. At each recursive call, I increment i until I have i. I don't know where I should stop. Okay. You have to make sure that if you do such kind of recursive call, you have a condition. If i is equal to 10, then you have to stop. Okay? Good? But normally when you do the recursive method implementation, you start with a problem, big problem of size n, and you try reducing the size of the problem at each iteration. Okay? Any other question? Okay, let us take a deep look at the recursion by revisiting some famous recursive algorithm we implemented on the previous lectures. If you look at the Fibonacci numbers here, we have defined this recursive method. And we have the base case, if i less than or equal to 1, we're going to retain 1. So no recursive call for the base case. Otherwise, we're going to do the recursive call. And the Fibonacci number of n is equal to Fibonacci number of n minus 1 plus n minus 2. Now, let us 
C if we would like to calculate Fibonacci of 5. I would like you to take a pencil and paper and take this opportunity for two minutes and try to calculate Fibonacci of 5. So, based on this recursive method, Fibonacci of 5, the first call, I is less than 1, that's not true. So, we're going to do the recursive call. We're going to do Fibonacci of 4 plus Fibonacci of 3, and we can have processing it. I would like you to trace this method. So, you draw the tree of decompositions of the problem. You start with 5, then you have 4 and 3, then 4 will be 2 and 3, then 3 will be 2 and 1, and 2 would be 1 and 0, or in this case, we are not going to reach 0, because 0 and 1, we can do it as, as 1. Okay. If I less than 1, we retain 1. So if we have 0, we reach I is equal to 0. 0, N is less than or equal to 1. So if N is equal to 0, which is satisfied, so we're going to retain 1. Yes? Okay. I think most of you got end up with this, yeah? Okay. All of you got the same tree? Okay, good. Did you see any problem in this tree? This is a correct tree. This is how the recursive call is going to do. So we're going to do the recursive call for 4, 3, then 3 and 2. Then we have here recursive call for 2 and 1. Here we have 2 and 1. Also here 3, 2 and 1. So do we do it efficiently? No. Why? Yes. So, as you can see, the same problem we calculated many times. Fibonacci of 2, we calculated three times. We waste the resources. All these recursive calls need a memory. Now, you might be not interested in this scenario because Fibonacci of 2 will not take too much from your RAM. But imagine you're doing this for a problem that the input size is a huge. So each time you do the recursive call, you're going to reserve some part of the memory and you're going to read from the stack and retrieve from stack. Yes, reading from stack is faster than reading from the hard disk because the stack is part of the RAM. But let us focus on this one. We should not do the problem twice. Here we did it three times. We calculate the Fibonacci of two three times. We calculate Fibonacci of 3 two times. Okay? So we waste the resources of the computations or the time. Okay? So is there any other efficient way we can do it by reducing this time? So this time complexity of this is actually exponential time complexity. It's very expensive. 
Okay? So, calculating Fibonacci using the previous algorithms end up with time complexity exponentials. And you can imagine now if you want to calculate Fibonacci number of 1000, how much it will take. That means 2 to the power 1000. Okay? Now, how we can design it better? We need to track the previous computations. So, here is the Fibonacci of n by keep tracing the previous Fibonacci numbers. So, the previous and the previous of the previous. Okay? We give these two as an argument. So, we start with the n less than or equal to 0. We say we're going to retain the previous plus the previous of the previous. And then we do the recursive call for n minus 1. We give the previous plus the previous, the one before the previous, and then we give the previous value. But to be able to kick this on, we need another method. Yes? So this method is efficient, but we need the starting conditions. What is the previous and the previous of the previous as a starting point to start with? So here we keep tracking two previous value that is necessary to calculate the Fibonacci of n. So if you need to calculate Fibonacci of n, you need n minus 1 and n minus 2. Now I give it to you as an argument. So you don't need to do the calculation. The only thing that you need to do is do the previous plus the previous previous. So here is the, the kicking point. We start the Fibonacci of n. okay, And then we say if we reach the recursive call as base case n less than or equal to 1, we're going to retain 1. Otherwise, we call a helper method. This is a helping method. Whereas Fibonacci of n minus 2, and we give the starting point, 1 and 1. Okay? And we end up calling this method recursively. At the end of the calculations, we're going to retain the result to the first method is calling the helper method. So this method, it's called itself recursively. It does not call itself. Why this method is not calling itself? You see, the name of the method are the same, but the list of the Ember arguments are different. So these two methods are different methods. This method received three Ember arguments of type integers, and this method is receiving one. So the compiler will know that the recursive call here, we're not going to call this method itself. We're going to call another method, receive three input. Okay? So we're going to call the Fibonacci where three input. So yes, the signature is the same, but, sorry, they have the same name, but they have different signatures. So this is called indirect recursions. And sometimes in the lab number six, you're going to do this. You need to do this. Sometimes it's very hard to implement the method without using the helping method that will help you to do the calculations. So if we calculate the time complexity of this one, this will be order of n. My question to you, can you see this? That the time complexity of this algorithm is order of n. Okay, so let us finish and then we can take your questions. Can you see why the time complexity of this is order of n? Yes, can you explain it to us? Mm -hmm. So you can think here is we are doing it as a for loop. So if you have a start with n, you're going to do n iteration, okay? n iteration or n recursive call because we're not going to solve the problem twice. Once we calculate factorial of 2, we're going to send it as an argument for the factorial of 3. So if we have factorial, once we reach factorial of 2 and 1, we're going to send them as an input to the factorial of 2. We're not going to do recalculation of the problem. If you look at the tree, I will sh show you next time, next next, next uh, slide. Anyway, let us now look at your question. Yes. 
Yes, because let's say, no, no, I understand. So, Fibonacci of, let's say you start, what is the Fibonacci of, some people in theory, they say Fibonacci of zero is one, Fibonacci of, sorry, Fibonacci of zero is zero, Fibonacci of one is one, Fibonacci of two is equal to Fibonacci of zero plus one, which is one, okay? Here in this example, we start from saying that Fibonacci of one is equal to one, Fibonacci of two is equal to one. Now, these are the initial conditions you start with. So you're gonna start calling the algorithm if you trace the code. So let's say you're gonna calculate Fibonacci of four for simplicity, we're not gonna do it, uh, for five or six, so four. So you start here with four. You're gonna check, is four less than one? That's not true. So we're gonna do the recursive call for n minus two. See, you start with four, now you're gonna do it for what? Two, and you send what? One and one. You go to this method. You start with the Fibonacci of what? n minus two. So you start with two, then you're gonna check if it's two less than or equal to zero. You're gonna retain previous plus previous. That's not true. You're gonna start here with what? Is one. Yes? One, and what is the previous? No. One plus one, that's two. And here, one. So you're gonna call the Fibonacci, this method gonna call itself with Fibonacci of one and input argument two and one. Okay? Now we're gonna ask, is one less than or equal to zero? That's not true. Yes? You're gonna go here. So you're gonna call with zero. What is the previous in this case? No. One, two plus one, that's three. This will be three and this will be two. Okay? Then now you reach the base case. The base case will say what? Which is two plus three. That's the one that you're gonna retain. Okay? You retain this value and you keep retaining the previous one. You retain from this point. Okay? It's good to have a pencil and paper and trace it. You will see that the pist the scenario that we send as an initial argument is one and one, which is the first two elements, okay? The first two elements to start the Fibonacci series, okay? Because n, Fibonacci of n, you need n minus one, n minus two, okay? So the base case, you need one and two, which is the base case when you reach them, okay? To build the base. And this will build the Fibonacci series because this is will build previous plus the previous of n. If this is n minus one, this will be n minus two. This is will be n. At each iteration of call, you carry n minus one and n minus two with you until you reach the base case, okay? So you will retain the value. Now, this is another way of implementing the Fibonacci efficiently. In this case, we use the map and we use the hash map. So we store the integers value as a key and the long, which is the value of the Fibonacci series. We start with the static initialization and we discussed the static initialization on the previous lectures at the beginning of this course. So at each time you create an object or, or call this method, you will start with the static and this is will be called only once. So static initialization, so the Fibonacci dot values, which is the name of the map, we put zero is equal to zero, and we put one to be equal to one. So we start this array, we put these elements inside the map. And we use the zero and one as the key, and the value of the Fibonacci as the value. Now we ask get n, get n method Let's say you get Fibonacci of five, then you're gonna ask Fibonacci dot values get five. If the value is not equal to null, you're gonna retain it. Otherwise, you're gonna go here. Here you're gonna ask get 
get value which is the recursive call for the same method for n minus 1 and n minus 2. So, if you call for Fibonacci of n, then you are going to ask the array or the map for Fibonacci of n minus 1 and n minus 2. Once you obtain the value, you are going to put it inside the map. So, you can see here, whenever we calculate a Fibonacci of value, we are going to store it in the map. So, whenever we ask, we are going to go back to the map and retrieve it. So, we do not need to do repetition of the calculation. This is how the recurse, the Fibonacci will be calling. So, you ask for 5, okay? you are going to ask the map is 4 and 3 is inside the map. 4 and 3 are not on the map. 3 will be calculated immediately, will be stored on the map. Now, 4 will end up with 2 and 3. 2 will be stored on the map, 3 is still not stored. So, you are going to do the recursive call, but when you do the recursive call, for the 3 and 1, 1 and 2, 1 will be in the map, and then 2, 1 and 0 will be in the map. So, each time these blue values are already on the map. So, you are not going to do the calculation again, and the order, the time complexity of this is order of n, because you have the 3, you have to do n iterations. After we discuss the Fibonacci and efficiency of Fibonacci and how we can implement it and change the recursive call by relying on the previous values that we calculate and carry it with us or store it in the map, okay, or store it in some array if you don't like the map or a list, okay. Now we look at the power of x. Power of x, if n is less than zero, we're going to do one over x to the power minus n. If x is equal to, to the power of 0, we're going to retain 1, which is the base case. Now, otherwise, we look at the x of n, and we check if n is odd. That means we're going to multiply x times x to the power n minus 1. If x is even, this is the formula. You have x to the power of n is e times x to the power n over 2 times n over 2. So, let's say you want to calculate 5 to the power 4 is actually is equal to 5 to the power of 2 times 5 to the power of 2. Yes? So, we can use this advantage. So, we can calculate the power of n over 2. So, we start with the n. We need to raise the x to the power of n. At each iteration, we have a chance, if n is even, to reduce the problem by n over 2. Okay, so this is the recursive implementation for the power of x version 2. So, we look at the n. If n is negative, we're going to put 1 over power of x version 2, x minus n. Okay, that means we reverse the negative of the power to the positive, and we do the recursive call. If n is equal to 0, we're going to stop. Otherwise, we're going to check for n. If n is odd, we're going to make sure that we take 1 n out. That's we reduce the problem from n to n minus 1. But n minus 1 will be even at the next iteration. So once we have n is even, we can reduce the problem by 2. So we calculate the recursive call for power of n over 2. Then once we receive this value, we're going to just multiply value times value. So, you can see here that compared to the previous implementation on the previous lectures, that as the best case, you reduce the size of the problem by 2. So, you start rather than having n, now you have the problem on the best case log n. Any questions? about deep look at the recursive implementations. So, if you are doing the implementation for a recursive call, it is good to look at the trace, the draft implementation for you, when you finalize the recursive method. Try to trace it and see if really you are doing the computations twice. So, you need to reduce the problem. 
Now we'll start one of the important topics about analyzing the recursive algorithms. But before I start analyzing the recursive algorithms, I will start with these two um, exercises to refresh your understanding about the recursive. So here is the recursive method that start with an argument string and i and f. Currently we don't know what is exactly this recursive method is doing, but if I ask you to trace the recursive call for these four inputs. So to be able to understand the recursive call of the, or the recursive method given to you like this, it's good to start by taking examples, okay, and trace the executions. Because sometimes it's very hard to know what this method is doing without taking some input examples and trace the execution of this method. So I and F, what is I, what is F, I don't know, okay. Now if I take this recursive method with these input values and I ask you to take let's say two minutes and give me the answers it's a true or false so then we can have some discussion about what exactly P method is doing or checking Take two minutes. He, he quickly knows what is. What do you mean integers? What is missing? You call this method with s. This is the s. The i is zero, and f is s dot length minus one. Okay. Okay, so what about the first false, second, true. So you can see what this method is doing. If the last element is equal to the first element and this will retain a new problem, reduce the size of the problem by removing the last element and the starting element and doing the recursive call for the rest. Until we have i is greater than f, we're going to stop and retain true. Okay? Otherwise, we retain false. What about this method?
it's receiving a string okay and as you can see the string that we received is zeros or ones I don't want to scare you, but uh, sometimes when you receive a question like this on the final, make sure the method is really well designed, okay, and will end up not like missing uh, some case or yes, the base case is there, but unreachable. So you will end up with infinity before you waste your time tracing it. But if you are able to trace it and you end up with final answer, that means this method is correct. Okay? To be able again to know what the method is doing, it's good to take examples of inputs and feed it to the method and trace the execution to see what is the value at the end. Did anyone come up with the answers? Okay. What is the first one? As you can see, we're going to check at the element at the last, okay? And we have the base case if the last less than zero, okay? So the, if the element at the last, okay, and we have the last initialized as the string length minus one, so if it's equal to zero, we're going to multiply two times. Then we're going to reduce the size of the problem by calling the same string, but now the last minus one. So if we start here with the last is equal to three, then we have last is equal to two, then last is equal to one, then last is equal to zero, then and we stop when the last is equal to minus one. So here we retain zero. Now if we have one or any element that is not equal to zero, we're going to add 1. So we have here at each time we have element that is not equal to 0. In this case is 1. We have 1. How many element here we have? 1, then 2 times 1, then 2 times 1, then 2 times 1, which is will be 15. Here, 21. Here is 6. Okay? So what is this exactly doing? Bi no, binary to, okay? So it's taking the string of binary and retain the decimal of it. Now, just to remind you, if we have a nested for loops, so we can analyze this as double of summations. So the first summation is to the n, and the second summation to n, and we have one statement in the middle, and the execution of this statement independent of from n. So it take one unit of time, and we're going to do the summation from i to n, and here from 1 to n. Now, the first summation in the, it's in the, is dependent on the outer summations, and which is, can be seen from the index of the for loop. You can see the inner for loop depend on the i, which is from outer loop. So the index in the inner summation is j is equal to i, 
and i is actually from the previous one. But the execution of this statement is independent from this outer loop. So the execution, let's say, one unit of time. So we can do now that summation. If you implement this summation, will be the outer, the upper limit minus the lower limit plus one. So you have i minus i minus one, which is end up with n minus i plus one. Now you have here the summation, okay, that you evaluated from i is equal to one, okay, then you have i is equal to one until you have n and this summations you can divide it in two half, n plus one and this minus summation of i because the summation would be distributed, summation is linear operator, you distribute it over additions. Now you will have this summation as n plus n times n plus 1 minus n, n plus 1 over 2 which is end up with n over n plus 1 over 2 which is actually n square. You can approximate the n square in term of time complexity. Such kind of analysis it's maybe theoretical analysis but I think if you come from the already take a prerequisite of discrete math you come across such kind of summations and additions and all of these uh, math. Now, if we want to trace the recursive call, we start tracing the recursive call by defining T of n as a recursive functions and n here is the input variable or the size of the problem that you start with. So, to be able to trace a recursive method, we start by defining T of n, F of n, W of n, whatever is the parameter you like, but we use T here to stand for the time and T and as a function of n, where n is the size of the input function that you have. Let's say you have a recursive formula like this, T of n, if n is equal to 1, you're going to retain a. If n is not equal to 1 or greater than 1, you reduce the size of the problem as 2 times the time that you need to solve the problem for n over 2 plus p of n plus c. So you can see if the, you would like to, to give me the time to solve a problem of size of n, I will tell you the time to solve a problem of time of n is equal to 2 times the time to solve the problem of size of n over 2 plus p of n, which is the size of the problem, plus c, where c is a constant. So, if you look here, the base case for the recursive call normally give like this, n is equal to 1, which is the base case, the time that you need to do to solve the base case, which is immediate solution. You don't need to do recursive calls. Now, these constant a and p and c are important to determine the exact solution of the recursive method, okay? But here we're not looking for exact solution. We try to calculate the time complexity of the recursive method in terms of the big O notations, okay? How much time complexity, order of n, order of n square, order of 2 to the power n, exponential complexity, or order of lo log n. So, to be able to formulate the recursive formula or the recursive function that represent the time complexity of a recursive method need to look at the program, recursive method, and analyze it. Let's say this is a, a Java program that is called itself and the problem here is a recursive method f receive n and if n is greater than zero we're going to do the recursive call. Otherwise we're going to stop. Once n is come to the negative value there is no recursive call. As you can see from the function, we get, are calling for n minus 1. So we start with size of the problem n, and at each iteration, we reduce the size to n minus 1. So by looking to this code, we should be able to extract the recursive relation or the recursive function as t of n or w of n, whatever you would like to name it. Okay? So you can see here, if n is equal to 0, okay, or n is just reaching a negative value, you will have t of zero, the time to solve 
size of n is equal to zero, which is constant time, A, which will not be important at the end of the pictures because we are looking at the big O mutations. Now, if the size of n is greater than zero, we are doing iterations. One recursive call at each time, we reduce n to n minus one. So if we start with five, we're going to have four. We start with four, we're going to have three. Until we have n is equal to zero or n less than zero, at that time we have t of zero, the time which is a. So this is the recursive call. So we're doing the recursive whenever the n is equal to zero, t of zero is equal to a, which is the constant time to solve a phase case problem. Now, to solve the recursive problem with a size n is equal to p, the constant time to do the comparison, to check if n is greater, and decrement n to n minus 1, then call for a new recursive method for a size of n minus 1. Here a constant a and p. a is a time to retain the solution of the base case. p here indicate the time to do f statements, decrement n, until you do the recursive call for n minus 1. Now, this how we formulate that recursive function. We still we didn't finalize. We don't know what is the time complexity. I think most of you now know that have some kind of sense what is the time complexity for this one. But here we take the code of a recursive method. We end up with the recursive formula. Now, having this recursive relations, how we can analyze it to extract really that time complexity. So t of n, if the base case, then some constant, that is the standard way. Else, we have time to solve some problems plus the time to combine the solution. Normally, you're gonna end up with following this equations, okay? So whenever you have a recursive method is given to you, you end up with the same thing almost. You say, what is the time to solve the base case, okay? In this scenario that we are taking it as an example, we have a constant time. But sometimes we don't need a constant time. Maybe the base case need not a constant time. You have to look at the implementation. So, but let us start with this example we just consider now. So if we have the base case, then we have the constant time because the solution always immediately available for us for the base case. Otherwise, we have to look at the small size of the problem, time for the solving some problems, plus the time to combine the solution together because we need at the end to combine the solution together. We need to fetch from the stacks, all the recursive code, remove the data from the stacks. How many, you're gonna ask yourself, how many subproblem I have? How much is smaller the subproblem compared to the original problem, okay? And how costly the combination of the solutions? These three critical questions, if I give you the recursive method, and I ask you, give me the recursive relations, you're gonna ask yourself these three critical questions and you're gonna follow the T of N formula here. So you're gonna ask yourself, I start with the size of problem N, how many sub-problem I need? For example, in some quick sort, if a natural scenario, you start with N, then you start dividing by N over two, or even in the binary, you start searching for array of N, then the next subproblem will be in over two until you have how many subproblem I have each time I, I, I divide the problem. Then how much smaller the problem? You start with n, yes, I, I have to go deep until in the, uh, tracing the recursive call or the size of the tree will, depth of the tree will be n over two log of n, but how much the size of it is n over two, n over four, n over eight, n over 16 and how much costly to combine these solutions together. So, uh, if you got the recursive call, recursive method, you extract the recursive relations, is now time to calculate the time complexity, expand the recursions, express the expand recursions as a summations by plug in the previous into the method itself, until you find the solutions. Let us see this example and track this example. Sum of the queue. I have a queue where this queue contains values of objects. I will ask if the queue length is equal to zero, I will retain zero. 
if the Q length is not equal to zero, I'm going to DQ one element and add it to the sum of the Q. So Q dot DQ will reduce the Q size by one. So at each time, I start with the Q of size n. I take one element from the Q, and then I will call another sum of the Q, but now with the size of n minus one. So one subproblem, linear reduction on term of the size by decreasing by one, and we have to combine the solution by using constant of time, which is additions plus one time for the sub problems. So if the size is less than or equal to zero, that means the immediate solution will be equal to B, let's say, time complexity. But if the size of the Q is N, which is the start of the size of problem of N, the time complexity will be constant plus the time complexity to solve N minus one. So we end up, we start with Java program, we end up with the recursive functions here in term of n. So you see here, to calculate t of n, you need to know t of n minus 1. To calculate the time or know the time complexity of n, you need to know the time complexity of n minus 1. Now let us expand it to see the time complexity. Let's say if we have n, then this is equal to c plus c times n minus 2. Then you expand it n minus 3 until you have, whenever you have, you can see the pattern here, c plus c plus c plus t of n minus 3. So each time you expand the relations. If it started with n, then t of n will be, time will be less than or equal to c plus t of n minus 1. You start expanding it and substitute. What is the time complexity for t of n minus 1? Will be c plus time complexity of n minus 2. Now, what is the time complexity of t minus 3 will be actually c plus time of n minus 4. Until you see the pattern here, k c plus time complexity of n minus k. Now, if k is equal to n, then this will be time complexity of 0. We know the time complexity of 0 is p, and we plug it in. You can see here the time complexity of this recursion algorithm is actually order of n which is the size of the queue. We're going to continue next time about analyzing some algorithms, recursive algorithms. We start with the Java code, we extract the recursive functions, and we expand the recursive function until we extract the time complexity of it.